it's an amazing time to be a glial biologist and particularly it's an amazing time to be studying astrocytes in the context of normal physiology, that is the development and normal functioning of the brain, but also under pathological conditions like chronic neurogenitive diseases, acute injuries, insults and infections and inflammation. And the reason I think it's really exciting is we now have the tools available to start addressing some really exciting questions to which we don't know the answers to. So what is a reactive astrocyte or for that matter what is a reactive microglia or a reactive oligodendrocyte? And we have a few ideas. We know that there are some context dependent and uh, initiating dependent reactive states of these cells. But looking more closely at the heterogeneity of these responses is going to be really important going forward. Is the response of an astrocyte to Alzheimer's disease the same throughout all stages of the disease? Or does it change from prodromal stages to early Alzheimer's disease to late stage dementia? And I think this will be very, very interesting from an academic sense, but also very, very important from a drug development stance as well. Also really important and interesting because we have the capacity and the tools to this now is what are the mechanistic uh, inducers of these reactive subtypes? We have some idea for scar forming reactive astrocytes. Um, we have some idea for pro-inflammatory neurotoxic reactive astrocytes, these being induced by STAT3 mediated mechanisms and pro-inflammatory microglia uh, in both instances. But we don't have any indication for other reactive subtypes of these cells in the context of different diseases. Astrocyte function and particularly reactive astrocyte function in chronic neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease is a fascinating topic for investigation. Historically, we would discuss astrocyte responses and microglial responses in diseases like Alzheimer's disease as being correlated with the disease and not really being indicative of the early inducers of the disease or progressors of the disease. But a lot of recent GWAS studies have really shown that mutations or at least SNPs that are aligned with uh, mutations associated with these diseases are in genes that are highly expressed or solely expressed in both microglia and astrocytes. Diseases like APOE, TREM2, things like this. And so what has been really interesting for us and for a number of people in the field is trying to determine now what functional changes these mutations would cause in these cells that highly express these genes. And this has led us to a number of conclusions that uh, we are further investigating and, and a number of other groups around the world are further investigating as well. So the first is, do astrocytes in the context of Alzheimer's disease lose normal functions such as trophic support of neurons that could be indicative of how neurons are dying in Alzheimer's disease? So if an astrocyte would normally provide trophic support to a neuron, if they stop providing that trophic support, would this be sufficient to initiate the death of neurons that is associated with Alzheimer's disease. Similarly, if we know that astrocytes are really important in the release of synaptogenic molecules, that is molecules that would help form connections or synapses between neurons, would a loss of that normal physiological function lead to a decrease in the synapse density that is seen very early in the disease progression? Similarly, if we look at microglia, we know that microglia are extremely competently able to prune and remove synapses both during development and throughout normal life in both rodents and in humans. And it's been shown by Beth Stevens and Su Yon Hong and a number of others that the microglial pruning of synapses is increased very early in disease progression. And so perhaps the loss of synapse density or a loss of the numbers of synapses early in disease could also be due to an increase in the phagocytic capacity of these microglia in diseases like Alzheimer's disease. So I think together, not only do we have genetic implication from mutations from tens of thousands of patients with AD and with a number of other chronic neurodegenerative diseases as well, but we also now have the cell biological and mechanistic understanding of how these mutations may be playing a role in changing the functions of these cells such that we can better understand how they may play a role in the initiation and the progression of these diseases. Over the last few years we've become increasingly interested in reactive astrocytes that are induced by inflammatory insults uh, which actually are very similar to astrocytes 
uh, or an astrocyte subtype that is activated in chronic neurodegenerative disease. And we found a close association between microglia, the resident immune cells of the brain, and astrocytes in the initiation of this reactive response. And what we found quite interesting, but obviously not surprising at all, as well as the fact that microglia respond first to these insults and injury. And I say not surprising because the pathways involved for these responses that are largely mediated by tolite receptor 4 and MITE88 are not or lowly expressed by astrocytes, but are highly expressed by microglia. But microglia respond first to these insults and injuries, and they release a plethora of cytokines and signaling molecules, of which three that are really important for the astrocyte reactive response include interleukin 1-alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and the complement component C1q. So one of the things we've been taken by is the fact that although it's been known for many, many decades that in a whole wide range of chronic neurogenitive diseases following acute traumas and injuries or infections, that there are changes in the astrocytic profile. Uh, very early on, this was done by staining, looking for the cytoskeletal protein, gliofibrillary acidic protein, or GFAP. But more recently, this has been done in a transcriptomic sense, using microarrays, RNA sequencing, and more recently, single cell sequencing. And it has been alarming to us and very surprising that although the response has some subtleties uh, within different diseases, there are some similar profiles of reactive astrocytes that are common across a wide range of neurodegenerative diseases. So recently we discovered that a reactive astrocyte subtype that releases a neurotoxin that specifically targets both mature neurons and mature oligodendrocytes, but not in the other cells in the central nervous system, is very common among diseases such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and multiple sclerosis but also very, very common in just normal aging as well. More recently, we have described a, a, a subtype of reactive astrocytes that are induced by neuroinflammatory mediators from microglia, and these reactive astrocytes seem more common in acute inflammatory insults and chronic neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis. And in this instance, these reactive astrocytes are taking on a negatively responsive uh, phenotype in the brain, that is, they uh, disassemble synaptic connections between neurons and release a neurotoxin that is able to specifically kill mature neurons and mature oligodendrocytes in the CNS. So in this instance, removal of these reactive astrocytes has a net positive outcome on the brain because the reactive astrocyte phenotype itself is having a negative influence on the CNS. So we have found that when we are characterizing reactive astrocyte subtypes in postmortem human tissue sections, that this neurotoxic form of reactive astrocytes is only present in regions of neurodegeneration. So for instance, in patients with Alzheimer's disease, we see these reactive astrocytes in the hippocampus, a region that degenerates in Alzheimer's disease, or in the prefrontal cortex in early stages of disease. And similarly, if we were look in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis patient donor tissue, we can see these reactive astrocytes in the motor cortex, the medulla, and the spinal cord, but not if we look elsewhere in the brain. And what's particularly interesting is if we look in normal aging, this is work that was spearheaded by Laura Clark at Stanford University, we can see that these reactive astrocytes are present in regions that are more susceptible to degeneration, such as the hippocampus and the striatum. So this lets us know that correlatively, these astrocytes are present in regions where neurons are degenerating, but also that these astrocytes are not present in regions where neurons are not degenerating which gives us strong evidence that they may be at least a, a correlative, if not a causative reason for the death of these neurons. And one of the things that we're doing now is taking this one step further to try and determine within those regions of degeneration whether or not these reactive astrocytes are present before the neurons die or are only correlated with when the neurons are dying later in the disease and whether or not the reactive astrocyte phenotype is homogeneous or heterogeneous within those regions as well. So we already know that not every astrocyte in a region of degeneration is activated down this pathway. But what we would like to know now is whether or not every astrocyte that is reactive is taken on the same phenotype. But moving forward, one of the things that excites me is the advent or the ease of access to do single cell transcriptomic analysis and single cell ataxic to really look at subsets of these cells in the context of disease. Are there particular 
reactive subsets of microglia or astrocytes that are present very early in disease, or are there particular subsets that don't occur in patients that are not susceptible to developing such diseases as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease? And this is going to provide a wealth of information, not only about the transcriptomic changes in these cells, but it'll also give us amazing array of targets that we can use to produce antibodies to so that we can visualize these cells in tissue sections from uh, patient donors. But also it will provide us with the capacity to produce new mouse lines so that we can actually look at the functions of these cells and the changes in brain function if we remove these particular subsets. It's also going to be very interesting determining whether or not the functions or the changes in the function of these cells are having a net positive or net negative effect on the other central nervous system cells they're interacting with. So one could imagine that removing an astrocyte that is secreting a neurotoxin would have a net positive effect on the brain. But recent evidence from Susan Kraussmann's lab in Austria has shown in the context of prion infection in which these neurotoxic reactive astrocytes are formed, the removal of these astrocytes actually has a net negative response on the brain, such as the prion infection is actually uh, sped up and, and infects more of the brain which of course has an overall deleterious effect for CNS function. So the time has come that we are learning a lot more about what these functions of these cells are and how they're changed in the disease, but the context of what effects they may have is what I think is going to be really exciting going forward. And we're only learning more about this every day with the advent of new technologies to visualize and sequence these really important cells of the central nervous system.